Welcome to Puro Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, Metro columnist, and I'm joined by City Hall reporter Joshua Fector, business columnist and editor Greg Jefferson, reporter Brian Chasnoff. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a couple of stories uh, that uh, in which Ted Cruz is uh, connected. Uh, uh, and uh, that one of them relates to San Antonio City Council. It doesn't happen often, but uh, that he, he gets in the middle of that. But uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the city's uh, anti-hate resolution that was passed last week. We're going to be talking about the uh, the case, which has gotten national attention of the, uh, the Dallas uh, hair salon owner uh, who refused to keep her shop closed during stay at home orders uh, and talk a little bit about some of the city's, uh, you know, financial challenges uh, and an op-ed from the mayor that ran in, in the express news last week. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the anti-hate resolution, which the, the city council passed last week. And uh, this was basically in response to the fact that there have been people, uh, including the president, uh, referring to, uh, COVID-19 is the Chinese virus. There've been people calling it the Kung Fu virus, um, and c- city council. And this was uh, Mayor Nuremberg, uh, kind of, uh, leading the way on this, uh, passed a resolution last week denouncing, uh, you know, the, the use of, of, um, that kind of language and basically saying the city was going to be vigilant when it came to, to hate crimes. Uh, Josh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this because this thing just blew up. You had Joe Pags, the uh, the radio uh, conservative radio host, who was. Uh, I want to make sure I get, I get his his quote right here. I think he was comparing uh, this to like uh, Nazi Germany, but he uh, he he's, he basically just made it sound as though that people were going to go around getting arrested if they used uh, the term Chinese virus. Uh, and then Ted Cruz picked up on that and said, "This is nuts," and. Um, what what did you make of this uh, this situation? I mean, did, did, did was it your sense that the members of the council who unanimously passed this had any idea that this was going to become such a big big deal? No, it's it's you know, and and this kind of keeps happening uh, with you know the San Antonio City Council where you know you're sitting in the meeting and they will take a vote on things. They'll just discuss things for you know a couple of minutes and then they'll vote and then it'll just kind of blow up in this big way uh, chick-fil-a um yeah. was was kind of the same even though there was um you know there was a lot of debate then about you know just sort of between the you know the different parties the people bidding on that contract and you know there was no sense that it was gonna blow up like that and this is kind of uh the same thing uh, the, the the thing that i noticed was you know while they were discussing it you know it was maybe about a minute into discussion uh, that Senator Cruz sent that tweet. And I was, I was a little surprised. I was like, Oh, he's already tweeting about this. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, there, there was this sense among, you know, some on the right that, that there was going to be, you know, some kind of enforcement on this. That's not the case. There aren't any fines right. or, you know, citations or, you know, jail time attached to this. You know, it's, it's just a resolution saying, you know, if you, you know, engage in sort of acts of, of hate discrimination, uh, specifically, you know, targeting, uh, folks of Asian descent, Pacific Islanders, Jews, immigrants, um, Mm -hmm. you know, basically blaming them, you know, for the, for the current outbreak, uh, you know, that's not acceptable. And, you know, but, but there, there has been kind of this flare up over the weekend that, that this is somehow going to be some kind of, uh, you know, criminal act to, to do mm-hmm. this. And, and that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, I, I found the quote from, from, from Joe Pags who said, uh, who said, uh, this is a Gestapo or Soviet move. And, uh, he described it and like you said, this is, and, and there were uh, other, uh, you know, publications, uh, that, that also, uh, I think misrepresented this, but said, uh, the essay, uh, uh, in Joe Pags' tweet, he said the SA City Council will resolve that if you call coronavirus the Chinese virus or Kung Fu virus, it's hate speech and authorities will be sent to investigate you. And I, I think, you know, there maybe part of the problem was maybe the the, the, the clunky way in which this thing was worded, because yeah. it, it it what it does is it, it basically says that using Chinese virus or Kung Fu virus uh, is, is something that encourages hate crimes and incidents mm-hmm. against Asians and further spreads information. Then then the, the council then resolves to say that that it's going to 
prosecute hate crimes and it wants the community to be vigilant against hate crimes. It's not actually calling the use of the terms, uh, those terms, a hate crime. It's saying that these are things that maybe uh, create an environment that lead to that. And I think that maybe right. people, it may have been a flaw in the way it was written or, or maybe just people just jump on these types of things uh, regardless. Um, I don't know it's what probably you all think. just about. an effort to rile up the, the base, right? Yeah, I, I think that's right. Or the cynical. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what, and go, go ahead, Greg, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I was just going to say, I think this, this just seems to be in keeping with what the kind of the theme the right is picking up now. Like now that, you know, the, at least in, in Texas, now that, you know, the numbers are, uh, you know, more under control, of, you know, the number of, of in cases of infection is more under control. They're now turning on, uh, you know, mayors, you know, the big city mm-hmm. mayors who who cracked down, you know, and imposed stay home orders, which proved to be pretty effective. Right. And are now, you know, it they're now just an arm of big government. And this is uh, this is just kind of in keeping with that. It's like another it's like another step along that path. It's, you know, big brother. Uh, first, they were, you know, forcing you to stay at home and now they're policing your speech. Uh, and you actually saw some of, you know, this kind of thing after the stimulus package in 2009. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was, you know, a lot of the imagery of the of the early Tea Party. I mean, it was it was Nazi, in, you know, imagery. Yeah. They were they were comparing, you know, Barack Obama to Hitler. I mean, yeah, put, put a Hitler mustache I, I on it. Being, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're directly related, I think. Yeah, it's I, the, I think, sort of. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's just kind of like the the culture warification of of the coronavirus. Uh, I mean, you, you're you're starting to see people. I mean, and this has been this way for weeks. But I mean, there was one tweet from you know conservative Todd Starnes. You know, he was he was complaining about you know he was having to wear a mask while he was going to shop for a for a toaster oven or a toaster like a department store, and like you know having to abide by. Uh, you know, sort of social distancing guidelines, only be able to go like one way down mm-hmm. a, a store aisle. Um, you know, it's you're you're starting to see that percolate more and more just kind of like you, you're seeing not just sort of like the backlash to the restrictions themselves um, mm-hmm. that are passed down by, you know, stay or, states, mayors, counties, but you're also just seeing sort of like a cultural backlash to like, I have to wear a mask, that sort right. of thing. <laughs> and, and some of yeah, this I mean, is, is uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. yeah I, I mean, we're some... back in, in, in early April when, you know, the fear was still, you know, was still palpable. I mean, you know, there was a pretty broad acceptance, no matter how you look at it, of, of stay at home uh, and, and travel restrictions. That's right. And now that, you know, you know, people feel like they can, they can relax a little bit. Uh, now we're hearing from them, like it, right at this point. And the irrational culture wars aspect of this, I mean, I think one of the, the things that, that fascinated me last week was you had uh, President Trump visiting a Honeywell factory in Arizona, and he was there because they were making masks. Um, so he, it was basically to commend them. And then you had supporters of his outside who were harassing members of the press who were wearing masks there. And the whole purpose of the visit was to basically commend this company that was making masks. And, and didn't Trump didn't make any Trump sense. didn't wear a mask while he was there. And he didn't wear a mask himself. Yeah. So I think he wore goggles for some reason. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the, the, you know, some of the, some of the, the aspects, I, mean, I think we're going to get into this a little bit more when we get to talk a little bit more about Greg Abbott and his response. But the responses have from the public have, have, have not really necessarily made sense. In some cases, they've, uh, as you said, Greg, they're targeting mayors who are basically in line with what the governor, executive orders from, from governors, but people are, are, are targeting the mayors instead. Um, and I think that this really comes into play with the Shelley Luther case, which we talked a little bit about last week, and it, it, it became a bigger issue uh, in the past week. Um, Shelley Luther is the owner of a North Dallas hair salon who um, decided that she was not going to keep her salon closed. She defied uh, what was an order, uh, an executive order from Governor Greg Abbott, uh, which restricted uh, or, or determined w- that certain businesses were essential and others were not uh, able to to stay open uh, temporarily. Um, and uh, hair salons were 
among the non-essential businesses. She defied that and uh, ripped up a cease and desist order. And last week, a district court judge uh, sentenced her to uh, a week in jail and a $7,000 fine for contempt of court. Um, and this, she has become a, kind of a heroic figure on the right. Um, you had uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick saying he would pay her fine. You had Governor Greg Abbott uh, amending his executive order so that uh, no one could be incarcerated uh, for for violating that executive order. And he actually moved up the date to last Friday, uh, the date uh, uh, for hair salons to open. It was going to be later in the month, and it, it's it, he opened them last week. So um, one of the things that was fascinating to me about this is the fact that the district court judge was trying to enforce a, an executive order from the governor. And then you had the governor turning around and blasting him. And it's, it's also worth, worth noting that, that Greg Abbott, when he first uh, introduced this executive order, was asked at a press conference, what is the enforcement mechanism going to be? And he said, well, you, know, you could get up to 180 days in jail if you violate this. And then he blasts the judge for trying to enforce the, his, the governor's order and says she, she shouldn't be incarcerated. Um, any thoughts on this case? Um, and, and, and I mentioned Ted Cruz, and Ted Cruz was one of the many people criticizing the judge. And on Friday, the first day in which uh, Shelley Luther's salon uh, was again open, he uh, made a point of going to get his hair cut there. There, there are photos online right now of the Dallas hair salon owner literally hugging people. And th this is the hero uh, yeah. I mean, of, of, uh, of the era here. I mean, she's, that's the opposite of social distancing to, to, to hug people. So it's just, it's curious that she would be lionized and lifted up as, as a, a paragon of, uh, of how you should behave during this time. It's, it's really, it's, it's, yeah. It's pretty pure Texas. It's it's you gotta love it. Yeah, a, a lot of demagoguery in action. What do y'all think? What what do you think, Craig? I just think it's uh, obviously cynical. I mean, as you as you pointed out very well in a recent in a recent uh, column, this is you know Governor Governor Abbott trying to have have it both ways. Uh, you know the the first the first uh, swing at the ball was actual governing. You know, it was like trying to put, <laughs> trying to put, uh, you know, restrictions in place that would be effective, and that you know the Texans would listen to. And you know, if 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 there's an enforcement component, you know, that's that's a little, that's an extra layer, guaranteeing that hey, people might actually listen to this. But then, you know, when you know somebody you know willfully uh, violates. An emer you know, this emergency order and, you know, they're, they're punished for it. And suddenly there's media coverage and we know this person's name. And, uh, by the way, she's, she's really, she's, uh, you know, she's well-spoken photogenic mm -hmm. and she's conservative Yeah, and, you know, conservative media jumps all over it. Suddenly it looks like governing is kind of hard, <laughs> you know, and it's just easier <laughs> Like it's easier to to tweet and to kind of undo the governing that you did before because you know it's it's just easier this way. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know there was a lot of political expediency uh, in in what the governor did last week and kind of uh, backtracking on this order. And you know, he's you know as, as we we've, we've talked about before. I mean, he is you know he's he's trying to balance. Uh, you know, different interests on the, I mean, they're both on the right, but I mean, you've got a more libertarian grassroots that he's trying to appease. Right. And, you know, he's got a more business minded uh, conservative wing that he's trying to appease. And, you know, he's also got kind of the dictates of, of public health. I mean, he's got, you know, part of his job is to keep Texans healthy and he's, he's trying to, to, you know, balance all of this. Uh, but last week, the politics won out, I think, pretty clearly. Yeah. And uh, he undid, you know, I think a lot of the goodwill he had he had created, at least as far as keeping, you know, the, the state safe. You know, it's also notable how what a remarkable ability Governor Abbott has to avoid backlash yeah. from 
from right. the base, from his base. I mean, if you just look over in Arizona, the the governor of Arizona, uh, Doug Ducey, I think. Yeah, he's a he's a Republican, and and he was not spared uh, by That's by right. uh, Republicans in in Arizona. They they were protesting him. But yeah. Uh, yeah. who are the who are who are the the, the right wing protesters uh, going after in Texas? It's not Greg Abbott. It's it's Dr. Fauci. Uh, you know they they, they, right. they leave him alone for some reason. Yeah, even it if they were lukewarm. Be- go go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it should. I I don't want to get too far into this discussion without noting that there's a certain degree of astroturfing that's going on with the Shelley Luther case. Uh, yeah. You know, Texas Monthly reported that this this uh, GoFundMe to basically raise legal fees was set up the day before she reopened her salon. So, I mean, there is a certain staged component to this. Um, but then the other thing that strikes me is that you know, you know, Governor Abbott takes away basically the ability to to find site people in uh you know those who violate the order uh you know basically you know obviously gutting the enforcement mechanisms for for his own order um but you know we we heard from you know county judge nelson wolf and you know mayor nuremberg last week you know they've been sort of adamant i mean i asked the mayor about this (laughs) last week and and he said look you know we're not going to arrest our way out of this um sure. you know for whatever reason the the you know when it comes to you know bear county and 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 san antonio kind of in contrast with you know houston and dallas who who were you know decrying the lack of these enforcement measures uh you yeah. know the officials here have have taken a, a more um uh, not relaxed approach, but they're, they're, they're trying, they're basically counting on people to just kind of, that's right. Yeah. You know, be, you know, to act in good faith rather than, you know, going around trying to, trying to find and jail people. And they've kind of been yeah. like that since, since the beginning of all of this. Yeah. And, and I think that, that that's a great point because there are some people who said, well, maybe uh, it wasn't right to, uh, for her to, to violate the, the executive order, but, but putting her in jail was, was way over the top. I, I understand that argument, though. I think what gets lost in this is, is that the district judge was was jailing her for contempt of court, not necessarily mm. for um, for for violating the order. But I think the thing too is one of the things that I heard discussed a lot on talk radio uh, uh, locally last week was that the judge had said if she apologized, that uh, she could be spared jail time, and it was kind of depicted in conservative uh, among conservative uh, radio hosts as though the judge was basically trying to make her grovel in his court and she refused to do that. And she basically was, you know, she was not, she was not going to play that game. And then he was trying to force her to, 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 to sort of beg for her freedom. And I felt like that was kind of a, a, a not an accurate way of looking at this, which was, it seemed clear to me that this judge was trying everything he could to avoid jailing her. Like he did not want to jail her. And she had basically thumbed her nose at the law and said, you know, your, your orders mean nothing to me and and I'm going to do what I want to do. And he was basically left in this position where he's trying to figure out how do I keep her from going to jail while also trying to maintain some respect for the law here. And so I think when he asked her to apologize, I think he was basically trying to get her, trying to see if he could find a way out of, of putting her behind bars. And just to say, look, if you said, if you say I was wrong, you know, I'm not going to do this again, we will be okay. And she refused to do that. So I think th- I think that's where he was coming from. I wanted to mention too that, you know, Josh, you said uh, you mentioned the GoFundMe uh, campaign. This was started by a conservative group called Woke Patriots. It raised uh, more than five hundred thousand dollars for, her. and uh, she also uh, qualified for a paycheck protection uh, program loan uh, from the federal government. So I, I mean, she has said that you know she was doing this. She was violating the law because she had to you know she had to feed her family. Her her employees had to feed their families. And there's no doubt that business owners and employees are really struggling right now. Uh, and uh, I think that most people can sympathize with that. I think what when I look at this, I, I think this was a state executive order. You had other hair salon owners who were following the law. They were they were they were suffering under the, under these circumstances. They didn't have a five hundred thousand dollar GoFundMe campaign on their behalf, and they decided to follow the law. And when the governor t- took her side on this, it basically said to all those people 
who decided to follow the law, you know, you're just a bunch of chumps. You know, you were, you were stupid to, to follow the law because if you violated it, there's, re- there's really no punishment right. and yeah. the governor is going to take your side. Uh-huh. And then what happens if there's a resurgence in, in coronavirus infections, like the second go. wave we're kind of expecting? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's undercutting kind of future, you know, future restrictions that, you know, are, are, are going to be in place to slow down the spread of this thing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the last thing I just wanted to say is that, um, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion over the years on the immigration issue and people who are, you know, hawkish on protecting the borders will say that the law is the law. And yes, people coming across the border or, you know, they're coming just, you know, because they want to feed their families and they, and they're, they're trying to escape difficult circumstances, but the law is the law. And in this case, the message I think from people on that same political side was the law is not the law or who cares about the law. Um, I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the city's uh, fiscal situation because, you know, Greg, you've written about this, Josh, I know you've written about this, um, city looking at about a $200 million uh, budgetary hole. Um, and the city has gotten money from the, the, the federal government, but it's the, the, the use of that money is really restricted. And, uh, mayor non Ron Nuremberg last, uh, week, wrote an op-ed, which ran in the Express News, calling on the federal government to uh, allocate more money for cities and uh, to kind of with with sort of a, a allowing them, uh, you know, broader range uh, of use to deal with some of the fiscal problems they're going to have. I mean, Greg, what what is exactly what is the situation that the city is looking at? Well, actually, I mean, yeah, so the city's got uh, a 200 million, an estimated 200 million dollar uh, shortfall. And on the other hand, you know, they've got $270 million in stimulus funds and yeah. you can't use, you, you can't use any of the stimulus funds to cover, uh, you know, operating losses or to cover, you know, any, any kind of budget hole. Right. Uh, nominally the, the stimulus funds are, are for, you know, they're to pay for, you know, medical and public health services that are brought about because of the coronavirus. Uh, but but beyond that, I mean, it's you know it's pretty wide open. I mean, you know there there are a lot of things you could spend this money on mm-hmm. uh, that kind of would fit within the parameters of the regulation. Mm-hmm. Like if if you look at uh, the rules for the stimulus funds for cities and counties, it's four pages long. Wow. And I mean, if I mean that may sound long, but I mean, geez, for a typical city contract, you're talking about you know dozens of pages of, of rules and definitions. So, you know, there's, there's a pretty wide berth here to do what you want with that funding. But, uh, you know, apart from not spending it on current budget problems, you also have to spend most of it under these rules by, uh, December 30th. So the, the city council and city staff is going to be on, uh, under a lot of pressure to decide just what to do with this $270 million. I mean, a lot, you know, obviously a big chunk of it is going to go to, uh, you know, public health. You know, you, w- one of the things you can do with this money is pay for, you know, pay f- payroll for city employees who, w- who are working directly with uh, coronavirus prevention. Mm. Uh, so it's likely to go into that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of discussion now um, about workforce development. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. providing a lot of job training sure. for unemployed workers because you know, I mean, obviously, one of the one of the many terrible things this this uh, outbreak did was expose uh, San Antonio's like real vulnerability. I mean, you know, this is I know we've said this a lot, but it is true. Uh, San Antonio is one of the poorest big cities in the country, right? And you know, a lot of our workforce uh, works in the service sector. You know, I mean, just 13 percent of the workforce alone works in hospitality. I mean, that's you know, that was wiped out uh, with this economic downturn uh, brought about by the pandemic. And it exposes the fact that, you know, this is San Antonio remains, you know, after decades and decades, a low wage city with uh, a workforce that, you know, doesn't have like the really necessary skills to do that higher paying job, you know, that kind of employment. 
so this this you know I think some policymakers and some advocacy groups like uh, Cops and Metro Alliance mm-hmm. they see this as an opportunity mm-hmm. to you know you've got a you know you've got a big pot of money here you can devote yeah. it to workforce development. Of course, that said, there obviously there, you know there's always going to be competing interests. Uh, you know, housing remains a big issue in the city. Right. Child care, domestic violence, you know, violence. So we'll we'll see in the next few weeks how this all plays out. Hey, Josh, if if we don't get the kind of uh, additional federal assistance that that the mayor is asking for, I mean, are there are there specific other or uh, basic services that we could expect to see slashed um, going forward? Or what, what what is your sense about that? Uh, well, they haven't, uh, you know. Deputy City Manager Maria Vial Gomez, who oversees you know the budget process, uh, you know noted that there would be cuts extending into the next fiscal year. Um, you know, given mm-hmm. the shortfalls, absent any sort of uh, additional stimulus dollars to help cities and counties kind of account for uh, that lost revenue. Um, but I mean, you've yeah. already seen uh, the kinds of uh, you know, what happens when uh, they face a shortfall. They, um, you saw 270 employees earlier this year who were furloughed. Uh, mm-hmm. You saw them make, you know, several rounds of sort of cuts to the existing budget. Things like sidewalk improvements were put on, um, like certain sidewalk improvements were put on hold. Um, so they haven't identified that yet, but we've, we've already kind of started to understand what, what that could look like um, given the previous cuts. Right. Well, uh, that's going to be, I think, a major issue going forward and uh, with still a lot of unanswered questions. I think we're going to wrap things up at that point. Um, Thank you all so much for listening in and uh, hope everybody's well and we'll catch up with you next week. Take care.